40 years ago this month is when Eric and I, Eric Kalnagel and I, declared a turning over of the paradigm related to human factors and human systems. And that process continues on today. It is not something that happened and ended, but is continuing. Right? And it was the first paper on cognitive systems engineering, new wine and new bottles, which was a very deliberate title, subtitle. And it originally appeared in February of 1982, 40 years ago, as a Rizu National Lab report, a lab where Rasmussen, Hallnagel, and several other people were significant players. Now, the context for this talk is the Titan series. And we should think about that label, Titans, because it refers to Greek myths about paradigm shifts. The Titans were overthrown by the Olympians, who were then overthrown by the Romanization of early Christianity, which was then overthrown by the Enlightenment. And that is now overthrown by myths about technological positivism, reductionism, uh, 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 optimization, that we can extract all this extra value from just optimizing these systems. The paradigms change. And what we meant at the beginning by saying new wine and new bottles is that this was a paradigm shift. Are you capable of revising and reframing? Well, reframing is a phenomenon of adaptation. We're going to talk about adaptive systems and how that was central, right, even back in 1980s, early 80s. How reframing is a unique human capability. Machines don't do it. Now, it's very hard for people to do it. It creates dissonance as we try to do it. People often don't do it and get stuck in stale models, right? They get fixated. Uh, but people can, we can, and machines can't. And what's really interesting is people don't even try to build machines that could, right? We are engaged in the phenomena of reframing at the same time that we're examining this as a phenomenon of cognitive systems and cognitive processing, cognitive work. And the point there is that we can't stand outside the processes, even though our classic way of teaching science says we're supposed to be neutral and outside observers, right? We are actually part of the processes of adaptation and complexity and change and finite resources. Right? So this radical reframing was about emergent patterns, about relationships across elements that produce new phenomena at a new level. Now the elements, the specific elements are needed in order to mark the set of relationships. But the pattern is not about the elements in themselves. The pattern emerges from the relationships and represents properties that are not present in the elements. Now, this is stuff we were pointing out and our colleagues were pointing out at the very beginning of cognitive systems engineering. And we'll talk about what that migrated into over the next 20 years. How people adapt to cope with complexity. That was the title of a proceedings paper from Jens Rasmussen and Morton Lynn in 1981. Again, notice right, that that's that is describing a story. It is verb-centric. How people adapt to cope with complexity. This was a central question, right, as part of the paradigm shift that cognitive systems engineering represented. Now, one of the important things about Rasmussen is he was enormously consistent in pointing out the centrality of adaptation all through the 80s and beyond. This is particularly easy to see, for example, in his 1990 paper uh, about human error or the 1997 paper uh, about society and, uh, and systems and multiple levels and layers. Uh, and safety is a dynamic systems problem. Right? Very explicit uh, 
But this goes all the way back into the 80s, and uh, Yen's always pointing to the centrality of adaptation as he tried to wrestle, and as we all tried to wrestle, that human error was a phenomenon that came out of how people attribute causality and make sense of failure, not a, an explanation of how systems work, function, and sometimes malfunction and break down, but rather a reaction to the possibility and actuality of failures in systems in which we have a stake. Right? Another one that matters, and there were many, many more in, in that early period that came to the fore, is that brittleness is a general risk, and it is an out-of-control risk with respect to artificial intelligence and increasing capabilities of automata. Right? This is what I wrote in a paper in AI Magazine in 1985, and Emily Roth and I laid out in 1987, right? And Phil Smith here at Ohio State laid out in the 90s in some aviation examples, right? That brittleness is a general risk that applies to all systems. And we saw this as people wanted to take advantage of AI in the 80s. So the hype and mythology of AI today was also occurring in the 80s and was one of the key contributors to why Eric and I laid out cognitive systems engineering. Um, now what's important is that shift 40 years ago was not about stuffing personal computers into cognitive psychology laboratories nor stuffing the mind into computations and it was about a lot more than just repairing poor designs in specific applications. It was a shift from compensating for human limits to an active expansion of how people, uh, people's ability or adaptive capacity, how to adapt in the face of change and surprise. That shift, right, was changed the base unit of analysis to the joint, joint and distributed cognitive, cognitive system, not people versus technology. Now that kind of a shift had been anticipated before. In fact, as soon as people put people versus technology, which happened as soon as technology, right, automata emerged, even mechanical automata in the 18th and 19th centuries. They see there's an opposition, and immediately people came back and said, no, they're not in opposition, but they work together as a joint system because one of the characteristics that make people people is the ability to create and wield tools, right? So the new unit of analysis is the joint system. That means there's always technology and there's always people and there's always multiple people in different roles with different goals. And it shifted the phenomena under study as we're observing, modeling and supporting design matters, how people adapt in the face of different kinds of complexities. Um, human systems at all levels including the technological and organizational factors at the sharp end and at the blunt end of, the, of what was called the socio-technical system, are continuously adapting. And that happens both to cope with complexity and to take advantage of new capabilities. In fact, if you say there's a bigger, the bigger shift that it began 20 years later that should have started in the 80s uh, and is still under uh, explored, is how people adapt to take advantage of new capabilities. So fundamentally, we're focusing on a pattern-based approach. Now, the themes of complexity and adaptation have come to dominate modern systems, even though they were enormously critical into what we were looking at in the failures of uh, many different industrial sectors, you know, starting with the Three Mile Island nuclear power accident. Um, and we pivoted circa 2000. And again, Eric and I you know, launched resilience engineering as a new field. Back to the line, resilience is a verb in the future tense. Um, now, NASA was now what's what what led to that pivot well one you know direct factor into this was nasa operating under a policy of faster better cheaper 
This was intense pressure, and it led to three space exploration accidents in 1999. And that's when I first proposed to NASA that the only way to deal with this was to um, uh, focus on resilience and develop a way to engineer resilience into systems. In 2000, it's important to remember, from 2000 to even, even as late as 2009, resilience was an enormously rare word. We, it's so popular, hyper-popular, super hyper-popular, I don't know how many more adjectives can I put in front of how popular the word resilience is to use in all kinds of ways in all kinds of contexts. It was enormously rare in 2000. In fact, most people looked at you and went, uh, what's that word you just used? I know it's English, um, but what's that again? That's odd, unfamiliar. Um, and the um, uh, organizational uh, reaction to the um, call for things like resilience engineering and investment in resilience engineering, which started it up and then was uh, sidetracked and derailed, um, it turned out the same uh, diagnosis uh, came to the fore in the Columbia Space Shuttle accident. And I got to advise the accident board and then testify to Congress in 2003, the US Congress, on the need for resilience engineering in order to be able to have safety of complex systems. A second factor on the pivot is I put together in 2000 uh, laws that govern cognitive work. And this was a direct uh, reference back to previous generation before me uh, and ways that they were trying to lay out laws that govern how systems work and formalize that. Um, the uh, pamphlet with a few changes is something that's available and reflects our understanding in the early OOs of some basic laws and generalizations that we've discovered from that previous 20 years of work. Now, the uh, the other factor that led us to pivot was a frustration uh, that despite 20 years of debunking, uh, organizations continue to use human error in order to retreat and retrench after their technology contributed to fatal accidents. Um, and we were just getting tired. We thought we had debunked it. We debunked it. If you go back and read the, uh, my position paper in, uh, for the 1983 Human Error Meeting in Bellagio, uh, look at Eric Hallnagel's position paper. Uh, these things all highlight how even in the early 80s, we, you know, Rasmussen focusing on adaptability as central to the story of hu how human systems cope with complexity. All of these things were trying, were, attempts to do work to debunk the idea that human error explains anything about how complex systems work, how the sharp end works, how the blunt end influences the sharp end. And so we said we need to adapt and change direction. So that leads us to what started over the next 20 years. Originally in 2004 when we held the first resilience engineering meeting in Sweden and what has gone on since. Right? We're about how to outmaneuver complexity in worlds of surprise. That thread has continued to grow. We're about adaptive capacity, how that adaptive capacity in systems that serve human purposes. See that verb phrase? Systems that serve human purposes. How that capacity to adapt is built, extended, sustained, degraded, and collapsed. So our shift in the spirit of Rasmussen very much but moving well beyond how far he was able to go, for example, in the 97 paper. We live in an adaptive universe. We're always in it. We can't be outside it. There are pressures, capabilities, conflicts, and successes that drive it. Right? One of the biggest drivers of complexity is past success. And it has rules. It has laws. There are proven theorems. There are provable theorems. There are hard constraints on the way it works. Hard constraints means you can't escape. You are not exempt. There is no place to hide. And the other thing is we've learned more about this in the last 20 years. It 
these it has these rules and laws, and they are not the way most of us think these kinds of systems work. Breaking the rules have consequences. And ironically, those consequences are things that stakeholders say they don't want to have happen. And yet they break the rules in ways that make those undesired and negative consequences likely or even guaranteed. That's a weird aspect of these human systems trying to serve some human purposes. Now, the new paradigm shift that resilience engineering represents as a successor to the one 40 years ago comes from four different lines of inquiry. First is organized complexity in biology. And the surprise there is that biological systems at all levels and cross levels have mechanisms to sustain future adaptive capacity because they know change will continue and new challenges will arise in the future. So that if you don't uh, uh, build up adaptive capacity now, right, you will be less able to meet those future challenges as change continues. Second, it comes from social scientists. Uh, there are many, but we'll highlight Eleanor Ostrom, Nobel Prize winner in 2009. Her term was polycentric governance, multiple centers, right, that determine how systems work, that have so there's layers of interdependent roles, each with partial autonomy, partial authority, and a scope of responsibility. It is neither a command hierarchy, can't dominate it by a single role telling everyone what to do, nor can it be a, flat, a purely flat decentralized. It has to be these multiple centers and how you synchronize and coordinate over them. In particular, she emphasized reciprocity across roles. Now, we could talk about some of the others who contributed to this line, like Carl Weick and others, but we're highlighting a critical person, uh, one of many in each of these lines. Uh, Nonlinear dynamical systems, control theory. Now, control is a bad word in many contexts uh, for many different disciplines and areas, uh, but we refer to this neutrally in terms of how we build systems that we can steer in a dynamic environment. We can steer through many obstacles towards goals despite obstacles and changing obstacles in the world. Right? This is stuff that developed in the mid 20th century and drives much of uh, the technology that we depend on in our societies. So it's about steering and that has grown into the label complex adaptive systems. Technically the area that people like John Doyle are working out is layered networks. Technically, it's about layered networks. And this has a remarkable shift in perspective or reframing, that is a necessary reframing, which we'll expand on in a minute. And it means it's about architecting, right? What Doyle leads us to is how do we build an architecture? He draws heavily on biology that will sustain future adaptive capacity you know, over multiple cycles of change architecting. And of course, right, where did this, that's the fourth line of inquiry? It's us in joint cognitive systems, cognitive systems engineering, understanding how people adapt to cope with complexity. And this fourth line is particularly important because we have the mo biggest empirical base, right? We have the most empirical findings. We have the most empirical generalizations, the most tentative empirical laws about how some of these processes work. And what's interesting, as we go further into the fundamentals, we start to understand the basics that lead to those empirical generalizations and empirical laws. Right? So in the last five years, a little longer, we've got new and emergent synthesis on the fundamentals. Some of these actually go back 20 years. Uh, and two comprehensive theories. John Doyle's theory is called the diversity enabled sweet spots. It's very biology driven, very mathematical, but it has some limits as it applies to people uh, and human systems and uh, the way that people adapt 
relative to changes in our technological capabilities. And then my theory, the theory of graceful extensibility, which is not, these are not orthogonal, but they're uh, different approaches with a common base. I think that Doyle really laid out about how we need to architect and some of the biological system findings we draw on. So let's explore some of the rules. All right. Lynn Margulis, one of the top evolutionary biologists, right, uh, highlights these and in some ways we can quote her. Right? Life developed by networking, not combat. So this highlights the role of reciprocity, which was central to Ostrom's work. So a convergence of studying human social systems right, with biology. Life is a verb, so is resilience. Again, a quote from Lynn Margulis, right? This is what Eric emphasizes over and over again since we started resilience engineering, saying that resilience is about what you can do, not something that you have. That's Eric saying, it's about the verbs, not the nouns. Uh, life is nonlinear. You have to avoid the tendency to oversimplify. This is Feltovich and Spiro, right? Doyle, all the work on the modeling and architecting starts with assumptions of nonlinearity. Life is poised to adapt. What do you need now to be able to adapt later when your situation, environment, challenges, and capabilities change? Your partners change, your relationships change. A biologist studying this today uh, is a Norwegian in, at Zurich, a Holland, right? And this is what John Allspaw developed in Critical Digital Services 10 years ago as a practical and influential uh, a mechanism that underlies all of the software services that we rely on from all of the big players and smaller players. Life moves through spirals of adaptive cycles. Right? And that means our research, our ability to understand the world, steer and steer in a complex environment is about how we can trace co-adaptive processes over time, roles, change, and layers. This is, goes back to a biological concept from the 1930s of a fitness or adaptive landscape, which has grown in many, many ways, including some ways to make this mathematical. But the fundamental concept is that things move through spirals of adaptive cycles that play out over time, roles, change, and layers. Variety of patterns. What's the big shift from the way we wrote about it in the 80s and 90s? We talked about adaptation, right? Now we talk about co-adaptive, and we talk about success and how that leads to opportunities and fluorescence, not just how do we cope with barriers and walls and impasses from complexity. Now, our understanding shifted in some ways. One is that systems are fundamentally messy. It's unavoidable no matter what you do, no matter how smart you are, no matter how thorough you are, no matter how well-resourced you are. Actually, there's not enough. You can't have enough expertise. You can't have enough resources. You can't have enough time. The system will be messy no matter what. That's what this found sign represents. The system was never broken, it was built this way. And I could tell you about examples of this with, for example, trying to deploy new autonomous capability on drones. Right? Despite hard work and great effort, there are a variety of factors that come into play that guarantees their anticipation of a future world that would, where a variety of new missions arise and new goals and new stakeholders utilizing the new autonomous capabilities that we can't see all of that world. We can't anticipate it all, we can't design for it all. Instead, we have to provision the ability to adapt when what we thought the future will be like turns out to be different than what we expected. Snafu is normal, right? Snafu is a coinage from World War II by the American grunt soldier on the front lines. Situation normal, all effed up, right? That is the natural state of systems. It's not ex an, an, a, a sidebar, it's not occasional, it's not, oh, they were bad developers or whatever. No, no, it's normal, it's always present. So snap, boot catching, being poised to adapt is essential. This is what biology shows us. That's what Holland's work recently shows us. That's what the 
COVID virus shows us, because the virus would have lost to immune systems long ago if it didn't have a way to have future adaptive capacity. And we've experienced it through multiple waves of uh, variants. Pressures are ubiquitous. We always operate under pressures. Those pressures and finite resources in an environment of continuing change drive messiness. All right, snafu catching ubiquitous. It is easy to become invisible and is misperceived as rare. Why? What's well, one of those laws I laid out in 2000? It's old. I just gave it a title right? and a label on a pattern, a law of fluency. Well-adapted activity occurs with a facility that belies the difficulty of the demands resolved and the dilemmas balanced. I could write that as an empirical generalization in 2000. Why? Because what have we done for the previous 20 years? Following the paradigm shift of thinking of this as a joint cognitive system, trying to study real world systems, how they cope with complexities and what kinds of complexities are significant, how they adapt, how they maladapt. Well-adapted activity hides the difficulties, the demands resolved and the dilemmas balanced. What was one of the first principles when we started? Study the demands, what makes problems hard? What makes situations difficult? That's what we were doing in cognitive modeling in 1985 to 87. We weren't modeling the people, we were modeling the problems that the people have to deal with. Um, so we have to design methods to reveal where and how snaf snafu catching occurs. And that's what has been prioritized as the empirical base in resilience engineering. Right? And it's why we emphasize exploring the gap between work is imagined and work is done, even though that's an old idea. It was always in the history of French ergonomics. Uh, you can see a recent paper uh, uh, that's in French um, that reviews the history and relationship of how resilience engineering is actually drawing on that early work. And that uh, in 2004 at the first meeting, we finally came up with the right way to uh, uh, translate into English the original French idea because the literal translations just never work in English. Uh, it's real, the real translation is the gap between work is imagined and work is done. And that has really taken off since 2004 uh, as a way for us to do our work to reveal snafu catching. So messiness and adaptation go hand in hand. Biology operates with the guarantee the future will not be like the past in ways that matter. Challenge will recur regardless of your competence, regardless of your past success, regardless of your ongoing improvement, regardless of the planned future deployments of new technological capabilities, which sound wonderful and in some kind of utopian world might be uh, great, only leading to new uh, successes and uh, uh, where all goals are met for all stakeholders, when in fact new forms of conflict uh, cascade and uh, congestion will arise. Improvements, capabilities, and success actually turn out to be one of the biggest drivers of new adaptive cycles that lead to new gaps, new anomalies, new exceptions, new surprises that challenge the previous confidence envelope. Right? Messiness requires future adaptive capacity. Biology abhors competent but brittle systems. That is critical. Competent but brittle systems. We first figured this out circa 85 in response to that wave of ridiculous overhype of AI capabilities once deployed. Right? You have a competence envelope and you have brittleness at the boundaries. What are we trying to do in the last 20 years is to say, how do you have a competence envelope and start to build resilience as extensibility at the boundaries? And if you wanna look at the biological roots of the resilience engineering, this video is available. Biology is poised to adapt. And so the definition that matters is what's adaptive capacity. 
and that's a system's readiness or potential to change how it currently works, right? change its models, change its plans, change its processes, change its behaviors to continue to fit changing situations, anomalies, surprises, capabilities, etc. How can you change? How can you update? How can you revise? How can you reframe? Reframing isn't simply something we study. Reframing is something we have to do. Right? So responding, uh, first off, surprise relative to past adaptations is ubiquitous. It keeps happening. It doesn't get rare. It isn't a rare thing we couldn't have anticipated. And we can run through example and example of that. Right? Responding to surprise requires preparatory investments that provide this potential for future adaptive action, a readiness to revise and a readiness to respond in advance of challenge at the boundaries. Right? If you wait till you're challenged, you're in the middle of it, it's going to be much more difficult to respond to that challenge, that exception, anomaly, or surprise. Uh, in fact, when we study how people work right, at the sharp end with uncertainty and risk, we find them Right, always being uh, good at uh, anticipating so they can act ahead or early in the challenge. So they have to be able to recognize that weak signals aren't weak at all. Right? They may be discountable under production pressure, but in fact they're signaling the world is different than the world you thought you were in. And you need to start modifying your responses, modifying your plans, modifying your behaviors to handle things. So how do we provision systems now to adapt and learn later when growth and change produces snafus? So let's watch this. Whether looking through lenses of chemistry, biology, or sociology, more elaborate things build up through the combining of existing things, resulting in hierarchies of organizing. In an article titled Graceful Extensibility, David Woods calls these self-organizing hierarchies tangled layered networks, a label that highlights their messiness, providing a contrast to the neat taxonomies and org charts we often use to describe them. Tangled layered networks. Now, Sue Borchardt made that video completely unbeknownst to me. And she explains one part of that paper so much better, I just play her video. Notice on the right, we tend to put things in categories, right? And we isolate one level from the other levels and say, we just want to study that. Versus understanding the processes and interactions across the scales. That's what the layered network across roles and levels that Doyle laid out that we have to architect drawing on biology. It's all about, right? Highlighting that these are tangled. They are extensive and hidden interdependencies. There are multiple roles, units, and centers, each with partial authority and autonomy, as Ostrom laid out. Partial responsibility to meet the goals of their scope, which should contribute to the overarching goals of the neighborhood of the network. There's always finite resources. Change continues both from inside that neighborhood of the network and outside that neighborhood. Uncertainty, novelty, and noise are omnipresent, and it's constrained by fundamental trade-offs inescapable trade-offs and how you balance those. Performance emerges from how the different units and centers regulate and coordinate their activities relative to other nearby units and to the changing demands placed on them, the changing pressures they're under. That's how we understand these systems. It's a change, right? A layered network, a tangled layered network of a human organizational technological system. The socio-technical label is out of date. Biological, cognitive, and human systems all intersect in one of the places we've studied resilience the most, which is emergency critical care medicine. Right? You can look at Xuan Huang's work on beyond surge capacity events, right? where we see multiple scales of how society provisions health care and trades off on different risks and resources, efficiency and productivity pressures relative to uh, health risks and uh, achieving health out outcomes for the population. Regional and emergency, uh, regional emergency planning, hospital systems, ambulance services, emergency departments, ICU, diagnostic, OR, clinicians, physiology. 
This is why medicine has been a primary natural laboratory for resilience engineering since the beginning, right? You can see our GAPS paper in 2000 or any of the work from Shauna Perry and the late uh, uh, Bob Weirs. Um, and of course, we saw all of this in the pandemic. Now, remember one of those lines from biology, life developed by networking, not combat? Well, here's a, here's a picture from one of those papers. And look at this picture about units trying to form a group through cooperation, coordination, synchronization, but there can be, you can defect from that group. But if you add in mechanisms for conflict mediation, you can get the emergence of a new higher level unit. And this was a description of how life evolved and became more complex, right? But this figure could have come from Ostrom. Ostrom complete, this could, belongs in, the, she has the words that match this figure in several of her chapters and papers, right? This could be completely described around human systems, right? Do you shift the risk and dump it on others? Or do you spread the risk over more units, making it less of a risk to the overall group or higher level unit? We see human systems that do a lot of risk dumping. We saw a lot of that in the pandemic. Do you have reciprocity that requires a local sacrifice of one part of the network, right? To get a global gain or a neighborhood gain for a larger region of the network. Part of all this is that growth increases complexity. Excuse me, complexity. Right? Complexity isn't something that we just try to ban. Let's go to the simple. Right? Growth will increase complexity, which generates complexity penalties we have to be able to deal with. All stories of technology are really human stories. All stories of technology change, if they're any good, right? if they're accurate, they describe or envision the new forms of congestion, cascade, and conflict that arise when apparent benefits get hijacked. Again, notice the verb-centric storyline here. Right? The new forms of congestion, cascade, and conflict, each of those words in itself a verb describing a pattern a pattern that can play out in many settings, right? And a second pattern, that the apparent benefits will get hijacked. Other players under pressure will adapt to your new capabilities and the successes that creates, right? Utilizing those new capabilities for their benefits and creating new forms of conflict with other human roles and what would be beneficial or harmful to them. Right. Congestion. Congestion is where and how saturation and overload occur and spread. Cascade. How effects spread and compound across the extensive and hidden interdependencies. Conflict. Different roles experience different consequences for their sub-goals, their area, scope, sub-scope of responsibility, right? leading to risk shifting, load shifting, risk dumping. Right? When new technology is deployed, though, yes, it has capabilities, but it changes the risk. Exceptions arise. Resources are squeezed in, different resources are squeezed in new places at time, and at new times. Change continues. Surprises recur. The system is transformed. You know, paraphrasing ideas drawn from Fritz Heider in the 1940s and Joseph Weizenbaum in the um, 1970s, right? What people see reflected in technology is rarely how the technology works or the new challenges that arise from its limits or how other people will hijack their storyline. Think about this for a second, right? Technology is always in service of some people's purposes and goals, right? What's connectivity? It's new forms of interaction between people new ways for people to find value by interacting with other people. What sensing? New sources of information to people in various roles. Technology is just another means for people to seek advantage. And when people seek advantage, they will put pressure on other roles. Right? 
Now, when people seek these gains, yes, aut automation and autonomy will be a part, even a necessary part, of the base competencies needed in order to pursue those gains for those people's purposes and roles. But whatever the change planned, embodied, and deployed, inevitably gaps reemerge, surprises arise, exceptions recur, challenges continue. And the biggest driver of, success, of change is success. Whatever happens, messiness reappears and people adapt, filling the shortfalls. Pressure over goals lead to conflicts about what to sacrifice and what to prioritize. That leads to adaptation. That's what we were observing in NASA under faster, better, cheaper pressure from the top administration, which led to three accidents in 99, only curtailing our space exploration goals, and then the death of the astronauts and the Columbia shuttle disaster. So one of the lines I've used for a long time is the future is implausible, the past incredible. Before the shock, what's your context? Well, reliability numbers are good. Or things are improving. We have a record. We have statistics to show reliability is going up, uh, efficiency is going up, uh, productivity is good. Uh, we have new capabilities to deploy. Look at these new technologies. Look at what those potential benefits are. The idea that we, that we are a brittle system, that we run a brittle system, that it's on the verge of brittle collapse in the face of surprise and anomalies is implausible. And so all of the evidence that says, all of the rehearsals, all of the things that show us brittleness get discounted. And the adaptations of people to provide resilience as extensibility hide those uh, gaps so that the evidence of improving, uh, uh, improving performance and new capabilities to insert all, all seem the dominant view until the shock event occurs. And now, after the shock, the past looks incredible. How could those unreliable components have created this breakdown in our otherwise wonderful system? We see a retrenchment and retreat where we re remediate these unreliable components. And what leads that list? Of course, it's people. What before the shock made the system work, overcame the messiness, was people as an inevitable source of snafu catching, as a source of resilience, as extensibility, when surprise attacks the boundaries of the confidence envelope. Afterwards, people are the source of unreliability that we have to get rid of, and so we want to automate more in pursuit of those increased statistics before the fact. Three perspectives. Now, let's take a couple laws about this. During the shock right, versus after the shock. And that's the novelty inequality. Bet you haven't heard of that. Well, you know what? Yeah, the name is slightly new. Uh, but this is an old finding. This is a finding we've been pushing for 40 years, right, that we talked about in the origins of cognitive systems engineering. Right? The potential for novelty when you're facing a challenging or deteriorating situation is much, much greater than the eventual, eventually determined novelty after the fact. After the fact, we have plenty of time and resource to figure out what went wrong, how it went wrong. Right? That completely misrepresents the situation that people on the ground during the shock event face. This is what we laid out. Immediately as I struck, hit the ground after the Three Mile Island accident and had to look at uh, how people handled emergency situations in, in high fidelity simulations and investigated other accidents in nuclear and then in other worlds. Uh, this is what we wrote about in Behind Human Error. Right, 1994, and then the 2010 uh, second edition. This is what Sidney Decker wrote about in the field guide to human error investigation, was how to get around this and go back and see the potential novelty they faced. Now, they may not appreciate all the novelty that's there. They may miss some of it and be unprepared for it. But if it didn't turn out to be a critical part of the event after the fact, people forget that novelty. I saw that in the very first nuclear power accidents we investigated in the aftermath of Three Mile Island. 
uh, and we could talk to, it, we'll talk to you about it in the context of space shuttle operations that we studied uh, in the early 90s. It's easy to miss the sources of resilient performance and the gap between work as imagined and work as done. That's what that inequality means. It's a kind of oversimplification. Here's another one, another generality that we observe, the component substitution fallacy. All incidents that threaten failure reveal component weaknesses. Whatever goes wrong, when it goes wrong and you look back, you will find some component or subsystem weaknesses. Why? Because it's finite resources. And you had to make trade-offs in developing, deploying, uh, modifying the organization, uh, under new financial pressure, and investments in expertise or training may change. After the fact, and you look back, it's easy to see the component weakness as the source of the shock event. And if we just fix that component weakness, everything will be fine. And that component weakness then gets labeled as a root cause, and oh, now we're done. It blocks seeing the emergent system properties. You cannot see any emergent system properties if all you focus on is the component weaknesses, which will be there. Remember what it meant to have a pattern, an emergent pattern. In this case, the elements do matter. We would like them to work better. But we can never guarantee, given finite resources change and trade-offs, that they will be perfect. Um, now, this is also psychologically satisfying because it reduces the dissonance in a very convenient way because it justifies a minimal response. Right? And of course, calling it human error is often the most minimal of responses and avoids the struggle for systemic changes. What's the result? is the persistent miss of all of our stakeholders that failure is due to brittle systems. They operate in worlds of complexity, failure is due to brittle systems, period. That's where you start. How is the system brittle? Where is the excess brittleness? How did we fail to appreciate the brittleness? How were there sources of resilience which usually cope for this, these points of brittleness? What undermined the ability of these sources for resilient performance to operate in this case? What stretched them beyond their ability to stretch to handle this? Again, the component substitution fallacy is a kind of oversimplification. Complexity penalties. As capabilities grow, scales expand, and pressures intensify, change creates offsetting complexity penalties as a result of the extensive and hidden interdependencies. This gives us reliable or competent but brittle systems. The brittleness is visible only, only in the anomalies, exceptions, and surprises that occur. So you have to check and build resilience and robustness in addition to reliability by recogn recognizing the signs of model surprise that events and the response to manage those events are operating outside of the competence envelope, what we thought was where we were competent. And those anomalies, exceptions, and surprises tell you that what you thought was the competence envelope is not your real competence envelope. It is smaller and different than you thought. You will always overestimate how big it is. You will always underestimate uh, the rate and form of surprises that challenge the boundaries in that envelope. And again, anticipations of this go back into the 90s and then go back into the 80s as we develop more and more understanding of and expanded our scope of reference for that original slogan, that original verb-centric phrase, uh, understanding how people adapt to cope with complexity. <sighs> so I just ran through this. Boundaries are hard to see. They're not where you thought they were, and they move. Right? And another fundamental constraint is the complexity of the system increases, the accuracy of any single agent's model of that system decreases rapidly. You can look at the uh, example of this uh, in Critical Digital Services, one of the Snafu Catcher reports called the Stella Report because we were all trapped in New York City during ice storm Stella. So the shock event produces information that your model of the world doesn't match the world you're actually in, which drives your need to revise, reframe, and rethink your models. Right? That's where we started. 
cognitive systems engineering and then resilience engineering were reframing paradigm shifts. And the resistance to it was the classic resistance and backsliding from reframing. AI has done this repeatedly in the face of continuing uh, recognition and studies to show the brittleness of automata and AI. They're brittle. They're always brittle. But AI keeps uh, saying that was the old technology, that were the older algorithms. We fixed those. The new algorithms will be higher performing, therefore we don't have to worry about brittleness. Now, what this means in a resilience framework, in an adaptive capacity framework, is the the, that the changes are only visible in the anomalies and uh, exceptions and surprises that occur and the responses to handle these. So that actual incidents or unplanned investments are opportunities, as my colleague John Oswald likes to uh, highlight. Incidents are happening all the time and handled usually, as Eric Holnagel likes to highlight. Understand how those work. So notice we made a shift from what we were doing in the 80s, right? And now our focus under the, under the paradigm of resilience engineering is to focus on what makes the system work. Right? Again, we anticipated it, but the focus has shifted over time and as our understanding grows. Do you get a return on investment? Right? There's costs on the sunk cost of these uh, incidents and how they're handled and the costs associated with them of, of information and learning. Because the incidents are a kind of stress test. Right? And usually the information about the stress the edges of your competence envelope and resilience as stretching or extensibility is lost. You need this stress testing and stress testing will come to you even if you don't want to do it. Right? So the issue is will you learn from the, from the natural stress tests that occur and will you set up your system so you can have stress events and learn from them without a brittle collapse of your system. You have to, the changes of between how the system works and how we think the system works is only visible in the anomalies, exceptions, and surprises. Now, all of this is evident in the multiple shock events that occurred in late 2021. General constraints that apply to those and to future events. Right? The, um, they reveal gaps and holes in our models. They're shocks because of the way they force us to confront that our model of the world, right, of how the world works, is not how that world actually works. How that world works, the threats those worlds face, the countermeasures and how they're effective or not affected or limited are all different than we thought. Well, think of this, remember, February's a one-year anniversary of the Texas energy crisis, right? Officially, it's 150 deaths. Estimates uh, uh, go up above 600 deaths. Officially, it's $200 billion of losses. Other estimates go up uh, a couple times that. Oh, wait a minute. Similar statewide cold snaps appeared in 2010. What happened? The reports that came out about the weaknesses, gaps, and brittleness in the Texas energy system right, were all highlighted and little changed and what little did change was of little significance to actually increase the uh, ability of the system to avoid a brittle collapse. Actually there was another one 10 years before that but because the nature of the energy system then was uh, uh, quite different because the pressures, the faster, better, cheaper pressures had not ratcheted up so much. Actually nobody noticed. There were no widespread outages. There were no long-term outages. There were no large numbers of deaths. There were no hundreds of billions of dollars of losses. But under pressure to make the system more, quote, optimal, right, they actually made it way more brittle. Now, we can also look at three outages of value digital services in the second half of 2021. Um, it was a, a Fastly outage. Why is that interesting? You've never heard of Fastly. Well, Fastly is a service. And normally it's an invisible service that's relied on by lots of other parties providing other kinds of value. So it's an infrastructure that provides value to infrastructures that provide value. Oh, this sounds like a tangled layered network. Or the Facebook outage in October, which took out WhatsApp. But in certain parts of the world, WhatsApp became a major 
coordination mechanism for all kinds of everyday business and other life activities. So the outage of WhatsApp actually undermined a whole bunch of critical services that have, didn't think had anything to do with digital systems, right? That undermined a variety of aspects of those societies uh, for that, uh, that period. Or the Amazon cloud services outage in December. And why do I bring that one up in the Facebook? Because think of all the resources they have to deploy. Think of all the human expertise they can gather up in those organizations. And they have outages. And remember, I'm only showing you a couple outages. The threats of outages of these valued services are normal. They're going on all the time. There's a stream of shocks and a variety of degree of threat to brittle collapse. Only sometimes do we see the brittle collapse occur. Why? because people are the source of resilience is extensibility, right? When surprise threatens the confidence envelope. So in these challenge events, there's an expanding but previously hidden tangle of interdependencies across boundaries that impact valued services. There's some triggering events. They produce effects at a distance as impacts spread over tangled lines of dependencies. These were things we noted in the nuclear power accidents because they were a tangle of hidden in interdependencies or unappreciated interdependencies. Back uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, the effects increased the tempos of activity over a wide set of roles in diverse organizations. They have to up their pace of activity and coordinate their activities in synchrony with other roles and levels. You saw how this happens in the pandemic. Right? The scale of effects expands across organizational and jurisdictional boundaries with regional and now we see societal wide reverberations. Right? The growing disruptions that flow from the triggering event put greater pressure on each stakeholder. Each faces bigger challenges for their scope of responsibility and then also for how their scope, how their activity within their scope supports or hinders or constricts other related activities. Right? And of course, as we see in the pandemic, Forces frag for fragmentation come to the fore and undermine the ability to synchronize over layers and roles to scale responses to match the spreading disruptions and challenges. Um, right? Small, unremarkable changes in one role within the tangled layered network reveal a, a dependency that disrupted the distributed network's functions. Now we could lay that pattern out, for example, in the Fastly case. Right. What led what triggered Fastly to have a breakdown? Right. What did the breakdown in Fastly, which was supposed to be a hidden service, right, that was of value to others who provided a valued service, right? And how that all broke down. Common resources quickly become oversubscribed when multiple parties begin to respond to disruptions. We see overload, bottlenecks arise and move around. They migrate through the system. Outages involve a surprisingly large number of roles and organizations, both in the genesis of the disruption and in those engaged in responding to the spread and those who have to cope with secondary service disruptions. New, remember, this is something that Richard Cook points out over and over again. One of our colleagues, both in cognitive systems engineering over the last 30 years and one of the critical contributors to the rise of resilience engineering. New capabilities start as non-essential improvements. As they provide value, those capabilities start to migrate and undergird primary activities, eventually becoming essential to those primary activities. Since the services are valuable, people adapt to take advantage of that value. Some other things die off or fade away so that eventually outages in those capabilities become crises and safety threats. That migration is fundamental. Another pattern, right? A set of relationships that play out over time as adaptation, as challenge, adaptation, improvement, capability injection goes on. Here's another one. This one's quite old. I learned it in grad school, but no one put in, no one summarize the pattern. And no one put a name or a label on the pattern to help us remember it. The bounds on perspective. The view from any point, any single point of observation at any point in time simultaneously reveals and obscures property of the environment. This is a fundamental bound on this universe. 
And the limit is overcome by shifting and contrasting over multiple perspectives. And we can demonstrate this with how the human perceptual systems work. We do this. We don't understand how we do this, but our brains, our perceptual systems do this. Right? They overcome this bound. What this means for us at the larger scale is all models are miscalibrated. They're partial, incomplete, and there's always going to be inaccuracies. There's always a limit on how well a unit, any unit at any level's model of its own or other's adaptive capacity. We don't really understand it. What's important is the ongoing effort to revise, to update. Right? That's what's required because it's normal to be miscalibrated. We'll think we can do more than we can really do. We think surprises are already well uh, understood and uh, resourced to handle. It'll turn out not to be the case. So we need to be able to recognize the early signs that it's not the case and update and revise and sometimes reframe those models. So this leads us to the discovery of graceful extensibility. Um, it came out, uh, published first in 2015, uh, in a paper I put out about four senses of, for the label resilience. All right, so graceful extensibility is this positive capability to stretch near and beyond the boundaries when surprise occurs. It's the opposite of brittleness and it trades off with optimality, right? We saw this, we discovered this by studying places where people adapt to surprise because surprise and the cost of mishandling a surprise is so tangible. Places like emergency medicine and space operations. So let's illustrate graceful extensibility, right? When you look at the world through the eyes of your plant, whether it's an algorithm, AI, take your latest fad, it doesn't matter what it is. When I look through the lens of that plant, at the world, it's always springtime. Well, it's springtime here and there's flowers starting to bloom. I hope they are your place too. And the trees look lovely as they leaf out and we're all tired of the winter and it looks great, right? We're moving ahead. It's gonna be a good season. Look at how great everything is. Wait a minute. Meanwhile, if you look outside the boundaries of that plant, outside its confidence envelope, there's the dragons of surprise ready to burn down your lovely spring leafy flowery scene and someone's over there wrestling with the dragons of surprise now switch points of view right here's the person doing the dragon taming looking back at another role admiring their plan look how great this is look how, how good it is look how much we've improved look at the new capabilities we've deployed right isn't everything look wonderful and the dragon tamer is over there saying hey please um, I could use a little assistance over here why are you, you know, don't constrict my ability to tame dragons and maybe even help me a little bit? It's hard work taming dragons, at the sharp end of systems. Now, those two roles aren't just people. That's not the sharp end and blunt end of people as we laid it out, right, starting in the 80s. We now realize those are two fundamental aspects of all systems. You need both. You need to be constantly improving for things that are well understood. You need to respond to the pressure now to be more uh, effective, more specialized, more productive, more efficient. All of those are things you have to do. Otherwise, you will not grow effectively and meet the regular vari patterns of variability in the world. But remember, biology knows for certain that there will be new forms of stress. Those patterns of variability will change in ways that produce new patterns of stress. And you need to be another capability as well. You need graceful extensibility to balance with the pressure to, to try to become more optimal or specialized for current conditions and patterns of variability. 20 years ago, John Doyle and Jean Carlson laid this out. And this is the basic pattern of complexity penalty. You get a surprising sudden collapse against the backdrop of continuous improvement and injection of new capabilities, right? That's the brittle collapse at the boundaries. As they put it then, right? Systems that are robust to perturbations they were designed to handle, yet fragile to unexpected perturb perturbations and design flaws. 
You're highly competent when events fall within the envelope of design for vari variation and uncertainty, but sudden large failures occur in the face of events that challenge or go beyond the envelope. This is why I say the component substitution fallacy is so pernicious. By focusing on a component or subsystem weakness, of which human error is always a prominent one, right, you miss the emergent system property right, of the risk of brittle collapse, which is the signature of growth because growth produces additional complexities in the form of extensive and hidden interdependencies. Right? This is the basic pattern. And the catch that drives everything crazy is that the pursuit, the pressure for optimality increases the risk of brittle collapse. So you have to have some investment in something offsets that, which was visualized in the animations as the dragon tamers, which is visualized in the history of cognitive systems engineering and going behind the label human er error and the sharp end, blunt end distinction in the gap between work is imagined and work is done. So we end up, whether you take a biological, cognitive, or human systems line of inquiry, they all converge on some stuff. Brittleness is a fundamental risk to all systems at all scales, and all adaptive systems have to develop a means to mitigate that risk. Right? That means all systems at all scales have to have the capacity for graceful extensibility. Right? This is very simply stated. Viability requires extensibility. Viability of a system in the long run requires the ability to gracefully extend or stretch at the boundaries as challenges occur. This is a hard constraint on all systems in this universe. There's nowhere to hide from it. Universal, because all systems have limit and will continue to experience surprise at the boundaries due to those finite resources and continuous change. Viability requires extensibility. Hence, right, resilience is a verb in the future tense. Right? Re resilience is a verb, something right, you can do, and it's oriented to the future. That's the definition of adaptive capacity. Right? And then we highlight the critical capabilities that ex support this, that support graceful extensibility. Right? The ability to revise previous models and methods right, as you recognize emerging vulnerabilities as change continues. The opposite is getting stuck in stale, but formally useful models and plans. It refers to a readiness to revise and reframe. The ability to synchronize over activity, uh, synchronize activities over roles uh, and layers, multiple roles in a network, to scale responses to the scope of challenges. The opposite is working across purposes, behavior that's locally adaptive, but regionally maladaptive. And that means forms of reciprocity are essential. Uh, and we saw a lack of reciprocity throughout the response to the pandemic uh, in various places. In fact, places that did worse, especially in the first two waves, uh, were, could be directly linked to a lack of reciprocity at a societal scale. The ability to anticipate challenges ahead and recognize emerging new challenges and vulnerabilities before your capabilities are overloaded or oversubscribed. And the opposite is called decompensation as a fundamental pattern. It simply relates to the ability to keep pace with events over time. And we often miss, right, especially when we think of things statically in categories and nouns, right, processes like keeping pace with events over time. Now, all these laws, rules I've come through have an odd quality. And uh, there's many more rules than I have covered today. Um, but we noted this from the beginning in 2000. In fact, this actually comes uh, from uh, uh, an English researcher who died young, uh, a, a compatriot of Turing, uh, Crape, uh, who laid this out uh, back in the 40s, 1940s. Uh, so again, a lot of these things have an old history that comes forward even across these paradigm shifts or reframing shifts. Designers can violate the laws or constraints of the adaptive universe, but their systems can't escape the consequences of violating the laws. You can't escape the consequences of violating the laws. Now, the simple example I use to illustrate this is, uh, let's design a car with a high center of gravity. Why? Maybe because people like to drive in SUVs, or maybe they like some extra 
capacity, or maybe they get a better feeling of control because they're sitting higher, or maybe they drive in Texas, in which case things are so dangerous on the highways, you want to be in a really big, strong vehicle, right? As my son who lives there says, every time I look at an accident, the truck or SUV is fine and the sedan is crushed, right? Maybe that's why you want a high center of gravity vehicle. Cool. Now, but if you drive a high center of gravity vehicle fast on curvy roads, what's going to happen? It's going to flip over. Have you ever watched a car doing that and flip over? I've seen one do it. It's scary to be behind them when they do that. Was it human error? Was it a bad driver? No. It's designed in the system. When you design the system with a high center of gravity, it may be great for going off-road on the savanna and on your African safari, but it's not great for driving, right, especially under slippery conditions on curvy roads at speeds too fast for the curves and conditions. It's a design characteristic. Mm -hmm. So you can design a high center of gravity car, but when you operate it outside its competence envelope, right, there will be consequences of its design as a system, not of some operator. And in fact, back to the fluency law, right, high center of gravity cars don't flip over as much as they should because drivers adapt and compensate. And how do you know when it doesn't? Generally, it's due to um, bad road design. There was one near us uh, until they redesigned the off-ramp. It was smooth, it looked great, and every time it rained, it didn't have to rain a lot, every time that ramp was wet, small sedans, small cars would, would spin out. Now, generally, these were not significant um, uh, passenger or, pay or driver injuries, but it was regular. I would drive to work past that ramp, it'd be a rainy day, and there would be a small sedan spun out on the side of the road with damage, right? It was built into the design. In particular, in that case, a situation where it's easy for people not to realize that there was a hole in the design of the system, right? In fact, we notice many of the laws I run through from the consequences that follow when design has broken those rules, right? Developers may find the laws optional. What's not optional is the negative consequences. This is not like physics. Right? But those consequences are a loss of viability. That's why biology invests in that extra adaptive capacity in graceful extensibility at all scales, right? despite the cost, the physiological costs and energy costs. Ironically, the, predictive, the predictable consequences of violating the laws block achieving the various goals and devel the developers uh, set. So here's our ending. Um, sometimes people like to go back to Ashby's law of requisite variety, which he stated most succinctly is only variety can destroy variety. All of this discussion as we move from the original paradigm shift 40 years ago and then through the second paradigm shift 20 years ago uh, leads us to a requisite revision of Ashby, the law of future adaptive capacity. Only the ability to revise past answers to the question, what is requisite variety, can produce future requisite variety. Right? The law of future adaptive capacity reflects that the world will change right? and that we'll need to adjust how we solve the various trade-offs in new ways to meet the challenges of the future. Thank you.